Hi, I'm Janus Keller and this is Out of the Blue, a podcast about all the great stories that come from the TU Delft. And my guest today is Bas Flipsen. And we are at the teaching lab now. Bas Flipsen is a senior lecturer. You might as well say the, the most senior lecturer that we have because uh, you ran this teaching lab for a short while, right? Yeah, a couple of months. A couple so. of months. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you are really a, a, a teacher for also for other teachers. I, I love teaching. So you love teaching? I love teaching. So I think that's something I found out when I was uh, 46. Yeah. That teaching is my thing. Uh, and uh, everything from then on really rolled like I would like to have. So ah. teaching, so being the, uh, the ad interim director of uh, the teaching lab was for me a very uh, high point in my uh, career. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. It's really so fun. I think a lot of people sort of have maybe seen the teaching lab or yeah. heard a bit about it, but so what is this place? It's and a yellow building. It's a yellow it's building. It's a gebouw. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 I think it's a, uh, the common room for teachers. So the common room where teachers will meet each other and will learn from each other. So yeah. it's teacher for the teacher and by the teachers. So all the teachers or lecturers, uh, as I like to call them, yeah. uh, uh, talk about how students work and how they can uh, improve their teaching. Yeah. And that's what this is all about. We have a lab environment where you can test out stuff. We have an environment where we can uh, learn from each other. So over here you can uh, have speeches or lectures yeah. or during the meet and eats. Yeah. And we have uh, a Teacher Talk Tuesday, for instance, where we just meet up yeah. and just talk about stuff which is happening at the moment. And it's in between the Faculty of uh, Industrial Design Engineering and the Pulse Building, which is basically yeah. the, the student's variation of the teacher, teacher's yes, lab. Yes. But, but it's for all faculties, right? For all faculties, yeah. yeah. And I can imagine it's quite a uh, long distance if you're from aerospace engineering, but we noticed uh, a lot of people from aerospace come over. Uh, ah. So I would like to invite all the physicists, uh, all civil engineers to come over at certain points. We have a lot to do over here. Ah, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. And uh, um, so you were uh, at interim uh, director of this place. And why was that? Sort of, how did you get here? Oh, before this, I did. Uh, I was one of the first uh, educational fellows at the TU Delft, and uh, for that, I did a uh, small research on how to make your uh, teaching more efficient, but also more effective towards the students. And what I noticed as a teacher over here, we never been educated as being a teacher. We just researchers. We educated as researchers. Yeah. So we all did our PhD, we know how to do research, but we don't know how to really approach those students yeah. and uh, how to get them in. And I think uh, I found that very important because uh, that's what I do, that's what I love. So I try to teach myself uh, and get more acquainted with what are the effects. And uh, I found some very nice literature, which is available everywhere. Yeah, yeah, there's and of course a lot of literature on teaching. Yeah, and, and we learn from that. And I try to get the ingredients out of it which we can apply for here. So 30% of the effect on learning is done by us, is done by our, us lecturers. And 30% effect on effective learning. The, so the, the teacher has 30% effect? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other seven Surroundings, so friends. Uh, fellow students. Fellow students, home environment, uh, holidays. Very negative effect on learning. Very negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why we need more summer holidays. Yeah. Uh, summer summer uh, schools. Schools, yeah, because yeah. summer holidays was originally sort of... Uh, did, did you know that? That it was instituted as a... You know, we, we don't want our people to become too... Uh, so we don't want regular folks to become too smart, so let's... Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah all right, nice. I mean, also, there needs to be... Uh, the farms needed to get their, uh, their uh, yield back, so uh, right, the people yeah. had to help. So people have but to help, yeah. When yeah. people said that really this uh, <laughs> has a bad effect on learning, they said that's good, yeah. because we don't want our people to become too smart. And it's actually being measured as being ineffective. Yeah. So it's... Uh, summer holidays are bad. Summer holidays are bad, yeah. Good. But they're, they're nice for us teachers. Yeah, <laughs> amazingly nice. <laughs> I enjoy it very much. Yeah. Um, 
So, so in the summer you don't have anything to do? I mean, oh, I've got lots of to do. Yeah. Prep work and uh, the long tail of uh, the fourth quarter, of course. So oh, I yeah. call the summer holidays also quarter five, where you have to have the long tail of quarter four and uh, the preparation work for quarter one. So yeah. that's actually, so it's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, uh, uh, tell me a bit more about, uh, the, so, so the, that research that you did, you made uh, recipes, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so what I would they look like? First, I uh, found uh, res uh, the ingredients for recipes. Yeah. So what are the ingredients for effective teaching and what are the ingredients for efficient teaching, yeah. effective learning and efficient teaching. Yeah. I call it sustainable teaching. Sustain so it keeps you susta sustaining yourself. And uh, if you do it uh, effectively, then people won't be back anymore. Yeah. Uh, and if you do it efficiently, you can go home at five. Excellent. Oh, so that's the efficiency, yeah. And, that's a, and that makes it sustainable as be, being a teacher. Yeah. So I have found the ingredients, or at yeah. least uh, I call them the 15 ingredients in total. Yeah. And uh, you can make recipes of that. So how to do this, how to apply these uh, ingredients in a teaching environment. Yeah. Uh, for instance, for lecturers, but also in how to approach a week. Uh, workshops, doing workshops, how to get students in, how to let them learn from each other. For instance, peer-to-peer -peer is one very effective way of learning. Yeah. So why are we still there uh, telling about what we, what we know so well for three quarters of an hour? It's yeah. completely ineffective. So yes. why are we still doing that? Because it's so comfortable. Right? Yeah, I know, I know. And it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> you can just wing it. You just can wing it. So I've I done my job. I have given a lecture of three quarters of an hour. Excellent, I've done my job. I can do really research again. Yeah. That's, uh, and I think we should, if we, we want more teaching, we should do different kinds of workshops. I love, uh, for instance, uh, uh, workshops of whole days. And I know you do as well yeah, so with ID a, Academy. Yeah, so that's my format. I sort of, I'm now uh, getting at the, so, so I, I teach a class where the whole format is a full day workshop. Yeah, yeah. But then I sometimes get Pressure into groups. the, uh, so uh, there was a one former student of mine, of, of us, Jefta Bade, he's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's one of those visualizers, and he often gets hired by companies to do a workshop for a day, or for yeah. an afternoon even. Yeah. And they see it as a day out, right? Yeah. Sort of, uh, oh, you do your show and we'll enjoy it. So he had this whole uh, rant on LinkedIn where he said, don't do one day workshops. And that was just when I started doing one day workshops. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a, some point in that, sort of how do you make it? Um, so my big problem is how do you make a one day workshop um, stay in the minds of... of well, you, you always have to start with learning objectives. Yeah. What are you going to learn during this day? Yeah. And keep that limited because you only have one day. Yeah, no, yeah. So I think the learning objective and getting to there yeah. at the end, getting to what have you learned, so reflect on it, I think that helps. Yeah. Uh, of course, I've done workshops also which are nice to do. Yeah. Then I've done pizza beer workshops with uh, design agencies where we just disassemble products. Yeah and learn from it. And I don't know how much sticks to it, but I've learned be behind afterwards. I always, the, the people tell me that they learned about new connectors or how things are really tangled to each other, which makes it very difficult to, how, how could they ever design this like this? Yeah. So they learn a lot by just doing this. And well, if they only learned one thing after your workshop, then that's, that's okay. Yeah. Maybe two, yeah. three, well, that's a max, I think. Yeah. No, but enough. my big thing is, so th sometimes all of that is clear and then so the workshop in itself is effective, but then two years later you, you see them and they say, oh, uh, I'm very insecure about one of the topics that we gave at, uh, at our workshop. And then I sort of say, you, you have the material and go back. Yeah, you have to do it, but you have to constantly improve yourself. Yeah. So one workshop is not enough. You you don't learn graphic design in one no, day. It's, no, it's and, impossible. And I, no, it's, it's, it gets you kickstarted, I think. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't do anything afterwards, it won't help. You can't play piano after a one-day workshop. No. You no, have to constantly improve yourself and 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 and, and uh, what do you mean? Um, uh, practice. Practice. Yeah. So constantly practice. Graphic design is all about practicing. I've been a uh, uh, a cartoonist when yeah. I was younger. When I was six years old, I started uh, drawing cartoons until six, until 18, 19, and I quit it. I don't do. I did some on, uh, on university for the university. Uh, uh, the Delta. Delta, the, the something like that. Not Delta, but for aerospace yeah. engineering where I studied. And 
afterwards, I never did it. I never draw cartoons anymore. And I, I noticed that it's, it's getting stiff. It's not really good anymore. So you're not good at making comics anymore? Not good anymore. But no. you, you I was very know, good, I noticed. You would know the path back to it. I think of, so. If you yeah. wanted to. I think so, but you have to practice constantly. Yeah. And you cannot do everything. No. No. So I focus on different stuff now. Yeah, so that, that, <laughs> that brings me back. So you, uh, you, so you talked about uh, aerospace. That, that's where you, so you're an aerospace engineer. Yeah. But you also are an industrial designer. Yes, I did my master in aerospace engineering. Yeah. With uh, Professor Thornbeek, which was like the half god of uh, aerospace air, aircraft design. The half god. Well, I think he must be. He's a god. <laughs> 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 he even wrote a Bible. And we call it the Torenboek. The Book of Thorin. It's sort of like the Norbert Rosenberg, yeah, yeah, but then... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you wanted to conceptualize a, 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 an aircraft, you have to buy the book, run through it, and you conceptualized. You came up with a design yeah. completely. And you made your back-of-the-envelope calculations for it, and that's where I learned how to do back-of-the-envelope calculations. Yeah. And come up with a design which probably will work, but now let's build it. And, yeah. and of course, then the engineering part comes in, the embodiment phase comes in, uh, kicks in, but that's... So then the Bible doesn't work, but you need interpretation. You need interpretation, yeah. yeah. And that's where software comes in, etc. Yeah. But first of all, you start with back of the envelope. That's what I learned at aerospace engineering. Yeah. And I told my professor back then when I was graduated, I said, well, I don't know, but designing aircraft is easy. You just put all the physics in a computer, all the requirements you have, so like 100 people on a range of 2,000 kilometers, uh, you put them in a computer and it will, well, poop out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an aircraft. They are cold, they're the same always. They have uh, the same, uh, they have, they, 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 they have uh, uh, the, same the wings, they have the same structures, etc. So why is this still human made? Human designed, why it's not computer designed. I think you can computer design aircraft. Yeah. The the, the, now, there are some designers actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bert Rutten, for instance, the brothers Rutten, they built, they really built and improved. And in, uh, that's what I liked then. So yeah. uh, Bert Rutten made a canard design. Uh, uh, canard? Canard. Yeah. Uh, uh, winged design uh, aircraft, which is really nice to see, which the wings on the behind and the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the small wings in front, and it was completely made out of fibers. That was completely new back then. Yeah. We, we, did, we only had uh, metal-shaped uh, aircraft, or aluminum. So this was a really fiber-based. So then you need the Bible again? Yeah, but that's, that's, that's where I think the artists come in. Yeah, and yeah. Bert Rutten was one of those artists. And those are the, actually the real aircraft designers, I think. And they're limited. And I thought, well, am I going to belong to this limited group of aircraft designers? Or yeah. am I going to do something completely different? And then, uh, then I came up with the idea for industrial design engineering. I did this uh, second studies, master studies yeah. on uh, uh, product design yeah. uh, with uh, Han Remmerswaal. Which yeah. is uh, another half god of yeah, me, sure, yeah. and uh, he, he, there I learned what ideation was, yeah. what uh, creative facilitation was, or creative uh, thinking is. Lateral thinking. Lateral thinking. I never had that before. Yeah. I was just doing my calculus, and that's it. And now I do a lot more, and that's what I liked about it. So I, I learned a lot during those two years. And so how did the, so how did the, the your your fellow students at Air Aerospace uh, react? Well, nobody designs aircraft there. No. <laughs> my friends are still my friends back then. And I only know one of them is an airplane uh, pilot. Yeah. Uh, my wife is as well, but that's uh, something different, by the way. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but they are airplane, <laughs> airplane uh, pilots. Yeah. And the other ones, they just do, they learned, they have this analyt analytical learnings. Yeah. That's what they picked up, but they don't design aircraft. They don't do anything with aircraft. I think only five, to 10% really ends up in aircraft business or aircraft design. Most of them go to logistics or uh, yeah, systems. Yeah, they're quick thinkers. I yeah. think most of the academics over here, they're quick thinkers, analytical thinkers. You can put them anywhere. Yeah. A, a good friend of mine, he went to the bank. He yeah. became a broker, which I think is a waste of time, but that's, that was his cup of tea. Yeah. Made a lot of money with it, uh, and I still don't. But yeah, that's <laughs> but so, uh, so did the... Um, 
did the, the, the fellow students, did they think you were sort of taking a step back or, uh, or a strange step? Or uh... I think my wife did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah she so she did aerospace engineering? She did aerospace engineering as well. And afterwards and she, she did KLM, uh, KLM school for becoming a pilot. Mm. And she said to me, I had this offer for being an IT specialist yeah. at uh, Pink Elephant, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is uh, now Oracle nowadays. They know Roca yeah, so yeah, Rocada, Oracle. I think. And uh, I had this contract in front of me, which with a good, well, I had my, my, my car, I had my phone, yeah. uh, I had a nice suit, and I could do IT, which is something I like to do. I like to program, uh, yeah. make my life easier. So IT is all about that. And I said, well, no, I'm going to study for another two years and have no money at all. Yeah. And she said, well, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy. She's yeah, still no, my wife, so. No money at all, right? <laughs> no money at all. And then, and then afterwards you did a PhD right away? Or, no, uh, no, no, no. First work I, of that? I graduated at TNO. Okay, yeah. And uh, I, did, I worked there for a couple of years in Delft. Yeah. Where we did uh, sustainable product innovation and I came in cont contact with sustainability and how to design eco design products. Yeah. And we did sustainable product innovation for companies. Uh, I designed uh, a heat pump system for uh, closed in boilers, closed in boiler heated by means of a heat pump, yeah. which is actually being. Uh, 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 the standard now in uh, CV kettles, the, the, yeah, yeah, the, the uh, yeah. heat pumps now. The heat pumps home. in houses. Uh, so I just in bought in a Panasonic heat pump mm -hmm. uh, in our house. Yeah. So that's, that's basically Yeah, it. I made a small version of it. Yeah, yeah so for the close-in version. For the close-in boilers, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they're actually too expensive. So it came up about a thousand guilders back then. And if you buy a close-in boiler, they were, were about a hundred guilders. So yeah. it's <laughs> Factor 10, that's not, you cannot sell that, no. it's too expensive. But also maybe it needed an outside element as well, or uh, like construction? Yeah, it was the, uh, the air from the kitchen. Oh, okay. The heated air from the kitchen is being transported outside. Yeah. And you can use that. So, yeah, so, was, would, was so the nice thing of a closing boiler is you can put it anywhere. Yeah. And this one you need to drill a hole somewhere in your house. Well, we actually had uh, this uh, air uh, on top of your stoves. Yeah, the air oh, yeah, that uh, one, diffuser yeah. is being used yeah. for that. Yeah. So it sucks up all the air and all the heat, and then it reuses that heat for heating up your water instead yeah. of just throwing it out on the, on the streets and heating up birds. Yeah. That's actually what we do a lot. Yeah, yeah. So it's a waste of uh, energy, isn't it? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's yeah. I, I didn't think about. So I thought you had to drill a hole in your uh, in your kitchen. Oh, it's actually outside. there. But already. it's already there. It's already there. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was designing stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, um, um, and then, so when you came here as a master's student, how did the, the, your fellow uh, design students react on, a, on a somebody who did aerospace engineering? Oh, I was, it was interesting. So half of the group were, uh, uh, I think, uh, mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers. So it was sort of a special program. Yeah, yeah, it was a special program with a group of 10, I think. Ah. And uh, the other half, half was industrial design engineers. Yeah. And when I was in, at TNO, I noticed that uh, the creativity is very high, but the realistic uh, they, of, of industrial designs is yeah. very high. They are very creative, but not very realistic. Yeah. And yeah. that's where I kicked in. That's where I came in and I just did some calculus, back of the envelope calculations to show, well, this is not feasible, come on. This is a very nice idea. And didn't they respond like, ah, you're such no. a buzzkill? Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, where, that's, where, that's, that's me. <laughs> yeah, you're a buzzkill. <laughs> yeah. No, so but I think if you, if you do come up with very nice ideas, creative ideas, ex excellent, but it has to be feasible. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. physics are limited. And physics is easy to do, so you can use your physics from high school to come up with uh, how feasible is it, yeah, yeah, how yeah. feasible the idea is, and they were really like out of the box thinking, and that's that's what I liked about the industrial design engineers. Yeah, yeah. And then, so if you think about, um, so let's go sort of you, you, your recipes for efficient uh, oh, yeah. teaching. Uh, no, I, I was just so my um, when I look at. Uh, the TU Delft as a whole and the faculty, we are, we run numbers, right? So if you compare it to any other university, um, uh, like uh, especially design schools around the world, they normally don't have like 300 students a year, yeah. Yeah. sort of in huge classes. Yeah. And, and so 
sometimes people and uh, compare it to a sausage factory, right? Yeah. Um, and so when I was, and I enjoy this notion of efficiency, right? It's uh, it's interesting because there's, as you say, there's much to learn from your peers. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes people sort of, th there is this notion like, hey, uh, there are so many rules and it's such restrict for creative people. They get sort of, uh, they get munched into our, uh, in our, uh, in our, uh, sausage factory yeah. and they're not sort of uh, they cannot express themselves that yeah. much yeah. so when I when you talked about efficiency I was thinking about uh, scaling up so not you as a teacher being home at five but having more students learn yeah but w what we know is that one of the studios for instance yeah uh, we had 30 students per studio and we had about 10 studios 300 students in total yeah, yeah. So we had one or two coaches in every studio, and at a certain time, nobody came up anymore. All the students, they, they stayed away. Yeah. Because they found it not very interesting, or uh, maybe they don't get out what they would like to get out. Yeah. And then I thought, well, what, we, what I noticed with the coaches over there, they just talked to a single person, single student at the, at the time. Yeah. And if you only have 45 minutes for a studio time, and, and you have 30 waiting. students there, you only have one and a half minutes each. Yeah, and Which you're waiting a long time for that person Yeah, and to come. Of, often you have discussions, so yeah. the most assertive students get all prime time, yeah. and uh, the less assertive, uh, they, they don't get any time at all. Yeah. So they're just there, and they just sit there, and they don't know how to start, because maybe they have a starting issue, yeah. and uh, to, to kickstart what they should do. And then we, we thought about it, okay, how can we improve this? So we, made set, we have designed this setup where we have a table with six students there, and they have to explain one of the uh, problems they have to solve, for instance in dynamics uh, course, on the whiteboard. So not on paper, no. not on a small A4 paper where only one guy or maybe yeah. two could Or a teach. laptop. Like or a, a laptop, like ah, a, a, a 13-inch living world battle, of, yeah, of students a, nowadays. A slag in Dutch, right? Yeah. Sort of battle. Uh, but, but on the whiteboard. And they have to explain one problem to each other. And if they don't know, okay, there are five other people, or five other students who can help him out, and maybe you should do that. Yeah. And what I noticed there, I saw people laughing, oh. industrial design and dynamics. I saw people laughing. They really enjoyed it. Yeah, which in my year, <laughs> dynamics was the basically we, the, the course you would stumble over, right? Start oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a very, very, it's they call it difficult. I don't know why, but it's really difficult. No, so it's numbers. It's numbers. It's yeah. scary. Yeah, it's it scares them off. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it's it's uh, the talk uh, in, in within industrial design. But anyhow, they were there. Yeah, people sticked. So there were about twenty to thirty people there. Yeah, uh, they were explaining to each other. And we as coaches, we can just walk around and help the groups out instead of persons out. Yeah. So and you didn't we had have one to do in five. Every group, right? Well, most Some and sometimes groups uh, uh, watched to each other, lo yeah. looked at each other, and yeah. saw. Hey, this is happening over there. Interesting, interesting. And that's what I call effective learning. People enjoyed it, they're yeah. motivated, but also efficient for us as teachers yeah. because we don't we go, don't give only give prime time to a single person. Yeah. And if you have to do 30, you, you don't have the time anymore, but you do it in groups of five. So a 20 a f factor five improvement of yeah. your time. Yeah, so really a factor five. And, um, and you sort of, um, you... And you real so uh, so this ba basically became a recipe, right or not? Yeah, this sort is a recipe. This one is of the recipe. recipes. So effective is because of peer to peer yeah. learning. We're all in the same ship. We don't know what to do. Let's start. Yeah. Uh, but also uh, doing stuff is actually very high in effectiveness. So actually just do it, and yeah. then on the road, on the on the pathway towards the, the the solving the problem, you notice what you need to know. Yeah. And you get that from the book or references or from your colleagues or maybe from the coach. Yeah. And then, and, and so uh, what was really interesting is that you're you're uh, you're you're sort of t talking about a, a starting place where there's uh, you, there's uh, there's like a situation standard coaching, sort of one half minute per person, and then yeah. you go to a new version. So, um, but still, still the same period, yeah. still the same time. Still, yeah. But you're iterating, right? Yeah. And, uh, and did you sort of go in one shot from the old system to the new system, or did yeah, you? Yeah, the, the year after we did this, yeah, and we introduced it. Yeah. And uh, but are I you still iterating on that same? Yeah, idea? The, the problem in that, you know, I'm not iterating on that. But the problem in, no. in that, uh, I'm not the course coordinator no, anymore. No. So the new course coordinator picks this one up, and I think it actually is being done constantly like this. Yeah. 
but not on all courses. But people can learn. It depends also on how you appreciate it as a, as a teacher, as a lecturer, what your thing. Yeah. Uh, can you, can you uh, align with that, yes or no? Yeah. And if it doesn't fit you, well, let's try something else. I like experimenting with, uh, yeah, that's with, it. with so my uh, yeah, that's teaching. It. And, and I, I noticed it with, uh, so, so in my course where I teach workshops, I, we repeat workshops. Yeah. And then it's really nice to iterate on it because yeah. you're basically, yeah, you're experimenting with students, but then I don't, so sometimes if you say experimenting with students, it sounds evil, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do it with the, yeah, so <laughs> we're in the right chairs for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but in the, um, every time I have the best intentions, you know, yeah. so I, I don't sort of let, let's, so I don't do two sort of let's put a bad and a, and a good situation and let's see the difference. It's more. Yeah, like, it's not very academic, is no. it? <laughs> But, but I, th I think it really actually, you're on top of it because you want it to, to, uh, to be successful. Yeah. So you're completely on top of it. So you're very passionate about it. And I think that also helps. You can convey that passion and passion towards your students. I think experimenting is not only uh, the, the good and the, the bad stuff, evil stuff. No. It also helps. It, it also improves. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And so always. I, and you were taught, uh, maybe, I don't know if it was in your master, but I was always taught like three concepts and then choose one, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we did it, be, that's the, like the, our god uh, uh, Rosenberg sort yeah. of uh, said that, and there are good reasons to do it. Um, but what I like about the notion of sort of the, the experiment iteration, it, it is sort of what we would call lean, yeah. uh, learn, measure, learn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're you're iterating, so you have your three concepts, but you have them behind each other, yeah. and and you you don't even have five; you have as many as the instances that you do. Yeah. So every day is becomes a, every week becomes a uh, iteration. Yeah, but that's what I do now with uh, advanced embodiment design. The course is running now at this moment; it's only two weeks old. Yeah. And students uh, have to work for two to three days a week on a full semester yeah. on a project. And every year I get uh, this evaluation at the end and I have to read it during the summer. Yeah. And then I have to prepare for the next year because I only have half a year. And then I think, well, I should have known this beforehand. So I, I invested some time in getting to know a little bit about lean, yeah. uh, lean approaches and how to constantly improve. And I think that's an interesting uh, uh, effect. So why can I not learn during the process? Yeah. So this year we introduced Hubert, and Hubert is a small chatbot, and I will send out this chatbot to our students, yeah. and they're going to chat, and I want to measure their stress levels. So how uh, happy are they, or are they very unhappy this week, and why? So that's what Hubert does. That's basically. what Hubert comes up with. It's an artificial intelligent agent, and uh, it just asks two or three questions, and students give answers, and if they only give yes or no answers, they the, 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 the system asks a lot further, uh, asks more. Yeah. So, but what do you think about it? And then it gives you some kind of idea at the end. Okay, this is a very positive week, is a neutral week, or is a, yeah. a very negative week. And that's what I want to know. I want to know the atmosphere in the yeah. course. So I will send out this, this email to our students to just fill it in yeah. and see how the atmosphere is up and running. And of course, there are high points but also will be low points and I want to know when and where and how can we improve that and maybe we can improve it immediately yeah that's what lean always says or maybe we have to change the course completely at a certain point and sometimes for next it, year. it might not be so you're also in the in the infamous uh, uh, ascension day uh, eastern uh, period oh yeah yeah, yeah, where yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have crazy holidays yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. King's so, Day. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, I think that increases the stress level or uh, influences it. Yeah, but I also noticed that uh, you cannot control them. No, totally. And uh, I think it's really nice not to control them. No, Let no. them go. I think actually they're master students. They know, they, they have their own idea about it. And if they don't have this idea at this moment, how are they going to become a master in yeah. one year? They have to. So. I think you can let them loose and they come up with very nice ideas, very nice ideas. You, we just give them some tools to help out. We try to monitor it and that's what we do with the course. And I'm really laid back in that. Yeah. So. I think the biggest challenge for you still in, uh, in that advanced embodiment course is, uh, is 
uh, teamwork, right? Some yeah, people are team very, dynamics. And yeah, so uh, especially some people, some students are really ambitious and have different notions oh, yeah, of yeah. Uh, working days, whereas others are here from nine to five, yeah. which is also a healthy way to look yeah. at life. And, uh, 37% is international. Yeah, so these are the... That's an interesting one. They don't have to go <laughs> home to their families. No, but they have different cultures, multicultural yeah. uh, uh, projects, two or three days on, us, on each other. Yeah. And we came up with studios. We have studios for them where they can live, where they can cry, where they can work together. Where can they, where they can do anything there for yeah. a complete full week. And I think that's very important as well. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to be annoyed about each other. That's all about <laughs> team dynamics. And I know there's stu some students who work very nicely from the beginning on. Some students have uh, difficulties with each other. And I think that's also a learning process. You yeah, yeah. learn that not everybody's the same. And some people you don't like at all. And that's okay. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is okay. But it's, uh, you notice that it's sort of, uh, if I listen to students talk about AED, sort of, uh, for everyone, teamwork is is uh, yeah. is the hardest uh, sort of. It's it's there out of control. So, if something is out of your control, which yeah. it of course is not per se. Yeah, you have to delegate it to yeah. somebody else, and he doesn't do it actually at the same level of quality as you would like to do. Yeah. And uh, well, I had the same thing. I think I burned out in 2014. Yeah. Because I wanted always this high quality, which I would like to have, but at a certain point. You mustn't do that because then you're stretching yourself too much, and you're not gonna have. You're not gonna be very healthy anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> so, so and, and now you're students are burning out as well, right? Oh, they are. Yeah. yeah. We had this uh, fast-forward meeting. Uh, students were from last year present what they experienced the year before to our new group of students, which is actually very interesting to see. And I told them, you can tell anything. You can also tell me off if you like. I don't mind. Tell them anything, what, how did you experience the course and what were your results? And I heard words like life changing. Yeah. That's an interesting, but also I completely burned out at a certain point yeah. because they actually work 80 to sec, to, to 60 to 80 hours yeah. a week yeah. at certain points. And I asked them, well, what do you think about it? Is that actually what you would like? To but it was needed for this one. And I, they, they think this is a real good invested time. Uh, and I was trying to limit it to 40 hours. You can do it in 40 hours. Yeah. But you want, if you want to do it very, 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 very good, you, yeah, you need more time for that. And some people need more time for certain points and, than others. Yeah. So graphic designers can do these graphics in one hour or half an hour. But if you want to learn more about graphics, it takes you a lot more time. Yeah. And that's not always being uh, planned out in the course because not everybody's the same. But if you want to learn during the course how to do these graphics, be you're welcome, guest. be yeah. my guest, yeah. and please do so. But and, of course your team members will go like, hey, I can do this much quicker than what you are doing. Yeah, so that's how you have to discuss it with your teammates. Yeah. And I think that's also fun. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I let them choose their own projects. I let them choose their own teams if they like, so they can team up, they can choose their own projects. And I think that also helps. It took take me a lot of time to, to group them in, yeah. uh, in projects they like the most took me about 16 hours or something, but I think it's actually very important that students do, accept, especially in this half year or a full semester course, where they're gonna work on this project. That, that it's very important if they have, they're motivated to do yeah. so. And the motivation comes from teammates, the motivation comes from projects, where they think actually there's a lot of flesh on, but uh, sometimes it's completely different direction goes, so that's not a problem. Yeah, and so uh, and then one thing that you do uh, let loose. Eh? Let yeah, no, that's so we, we've <laughs> talked a long about uh, about education, which is great. But one thing you do within uh, ID Academy, you uh, teach a uh, sort of a uh, repair cafe yeah. where you open up uh, products. And you talk yeah. about the pizza sessions with designers opening up products. Yeah, and that is uh, uh, so. What I did when I was younger. Yeah, I opened up products. Yeah. my hobby became my profession, which is. Uh, Actually, very nice. I think. So if you, and if you <laughs> if you see a product, you automatically sort of think of it as a yeah. thing that can be opened, right? Yeah, yeah. I opened TV sets when I was ten or something, and I even blacked out the complete house because of it. Because yeah. I yeah. forgot to take out the the, the fuse, grid, the yeah. fuse, the grid connector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly, you know, a lot of voltage came over me. But yeah, there are 
I'm not Condens- dead yet. Condensators on it yeah. that can give you it shocks, didn't, right? It didn't kill me, so... <laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And now, now I know I have to pull the plug before I'm going to go into the TV set. Yeah. But then again, a TV set still has this condensator, which is uh, very dangerous. Yeah. Even yeah. more dangerous than the, the plug. Yeah, but now... Always unplug. Yeah, but now new uh, TV sets don't even have that anymore. Oh, no, no, no. There's everything is low voltage now, right? Uh, everything they're, is they're, I think they're also less fun because yeah. there are only PCBs inside and not the, the, the real electronics inside where you can even change uh, uh, resistors or uh, condensators or whatever. It's, 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 it's a little bit less fun anymore. I think. It's less fun, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, because... Um, so you you uh, you do uh, the uh, Netherlands version of I Fix It, right? Mm-hmm. That's uh, so. What what is it? What is that? I Fix It is a company U.S. based, yeah. and we're also in Stuttgart based. So I work there for one day a week. In Stuttgart? No, in you Stuttgart, work remote, yeah. right? Yeah, I work remote in Delft, but I yeah. sometimes uh, drive in oh. uh, by train yeah. nowadays. Good. Not by plane anymore. It's easier. But anyhow. Uh, where we uh, make uh, online uh, manuals for uh, dismantling products. Yeah. So how to open, especially focusing on smartphones, tablets and uh, yeah, computers. Yeah. So iMacs and that kind of stuff. So you can upgrade your iMac. It's, it's doable, but you need to know how. Yeah. And that's why we come up with these uh, manuals. So Kyle Weens uh, designed this called Complete Platform. Yeah. And we make money because of it, but because we sell the tools. Yeah. So we sell screwdrivers. We sell uh, uh, components yeah. like batteries for iPhones. Yeah. Uh, you can buy the improved iPhone battery at iFixit, which Apple doesn't e- even have. So it has a longer uh, extent the time li- li- lifetime of a product. Yeah. Because after two years or three years, people get rid of their smartphones and we wanted to extend the life of products. Yeah. And that's, a, that's how we do it, yeah. by means of DIY repair. Do, do it yourself repair. Do yeah. it yourself repair, yeah. yeah. And I've actually, uh, I, I've been a Kyle Reese fan for a while. He's, of course, also famous because he's the first one to get a product and then take it apart. Right? Yeah, yeah. He had this iPhone X, the iPhone 10. Yeah, or he bought it in Austria, uh, in, in Australia, yeah. in Australia, where the first one came out. And he went there and he put it on the X-ray and yeah. uh, he opened it up. And, that's, and it's all in the video in his blog, in his vlog. And it's really interesting to see. That's, that's, we want to be the first ones in the world on top of it. And you give it a grade, right? Uh, and we, we, we rate it, we score it. Yeah. And we have, uh, actually we have a scoring system now, but we, I build a new scoring system uh, based on uh, ease of disassembly also. Yeah. So how easy is to open up a product, how easy is to, to disassemble until the critical components. Yeah. And that's what my research is all about. And it has sort of a, a, a rebellious streak, right? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know the first time they did, uh, the, so there's, uh, the, they had pantalope screws in the iPhones and then at iFixit I could buy the screwdriver yeah. and uh, regular Phillips screws and a new screw. to replace yeah, them yeah. so that you don't, didn't need the pantalope screw. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of the yeah, that kind of stuff. We make uh, small bits which actually fit. Yeah, but it's sort of rebellious, it's like sort of oh, your yeah, product yeah, is yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. You you have have to they don't always, always like us. Yeah. But we're constantly in contact. I see them on conferences. I see Apple on conferences. I see uh, Samsung on conferences, Philips. And they, they, they say, well, it's all about repair. It's, it's okay. Yeah. But not if people do it themselves. Yeah. Because that's actually very uh, dangerous because they can get killed in the process. That's, that's, By an that's what they tell. And they, they also say, well, nobody would like to do that. Nobody wants to repair their own product. And actually, we have one mil- million views on documents every every month. So nobody, well, I think it's uh, they're so actually, exaggerating. I you, think. you told me that you said oh, it's a, such a pity that nobody opens up their phone anymore. Or something yeah. Like that. Actually, uh, my son just my 17 year old son last uh, uh, in mm-hmm. December opened up his iPhone and replaced the battery yeah. and the button and so basically oh, everything yeah. was yeah. changed. Yeah. And then, of course, the day after he broke it again, but, uh, and, but it, it extended the life with one day. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, he, uh, uh, and he took like, that after that, he, could say, he said, okay, let me get my sister's phone and sort of plug yeah. their parts from that one. And now he knows better. Yeah. My first, I, I opened up my cassette player when I was younger. I was about 10. But the cassette player was my thing. I had it on, uh, on when we, go, when we go on holiday nowadays. They just look at the tablets. I had this cassette player. We had three, four cassettes so with stories. So a mobile, a blaster. Basically. No, a small one, very oh. small one. Yeah. 
But I opened it up and I cut up all the wires and I thought, well, I can <laughs> reassemble it. Never worked. Never, Never worked, worked, worked anymore. That's right. <laughs> and we had our story. So I, uh, we, we also, uh, we had a projector, a DLP projector. Uh, uh, on our as, as our television oh yeah so that's fun if uh, if the so we had a projector in our house it broke down the the lamp exploded oh yeah, yeah. so that yeah. so and then of course changing a lamp is easy but then it turned out that the color wheel was also uh, oh broken okay so we changed that okay my wife did it because I, my hands are not that precise oh we had a lot of fun but it didn't work oh, okay well a lot of fun is also a lot that's it sort of yeah, we caved in at the uh, end and bought a new you know, one. I had this product autopsy workshops, yeah. so autopsying products. I had them with my kids at a Sunday afternoon, so I had this whole bunch of stuff in my garage. And I said, well, just open it up. So I had this uh, a, a screwdriver, no, no, not screw the, the drill. Yeah. One drill, I had a keyboard from computer and my, my son was there, my uh, uh, daughter was there and also a friend of uh, them. And he asked me some, what's his name? He asked me, can I actually open, open it up? I said, well, you have to. This is what we're going to do today. It's the rule. Just, it's the rule and make something out of it. So they actually did it and it was a lot of fun. I made some pictures which I constantly use nowadays because it was so much fun to open up stuff. But so where did that uh, reservation come from? I think parents. Not allowed? Parents, yeah, they don't allow it anymore. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, when you opened up the cassette deck, your parents I think were not happy, They, did, they never told me off, never. They no. never told me I shouldn't open it up. I just did it. Maybe that was my uh, curiosity I, I had in how things are actually working. That's why I became an engineer. I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was already there. But I think it's the curiosity of opening stuff. So I would love, love to have our students coming over here fresh and opened at least two or three products yeah. before. And uh, actually, that's not the case. They, some, most of them never opened up something, which no. is strange, well, I think. So actually, uh, when we did your uh, uh, repair cafe, you asked people to bring products. I brought some products, you brought some yeah. products, and they opened it up. And then in the feedback, some students said, I already opened up a product once at <laughs> uh, uh, product optimization or something. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the bachelor's first years, they do like one where they sort of do a... Yeah, I think they had once at uh, the washing machine. Yeah. Which is a very interesting case. Uh, so uh, Nina Haber had brought in 25 washing machines and they had to open it up. Every studio had to open up the washing machine. Yeah, and I saw just like a couple of weeks ago, I saw the products laying out. Yeah. But, and and it's, it's really nice to see those. Uh, it's, it's, it's art, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's art. It's really, if, if you put it somewhere and make nice pictures out of it too. Very, it's very arty. Yeah, and even the, the I fix it uh, photos are sort of, they have a certain aesthetic quality to them. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, we, we invest a lot of money in that, by the way. So in we sure have these photo studios yeah. uh, to open up products, but also to, to, to make photos. And we to also align have the products? Yeah, yeah th th there is a manual online on how to make awesome pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that also has nice pictures, right? Yeah, uh, uh, excellent <laughs> pictures. Yeah. So wh which hand are we going to use? Are we going to use a, a scuffled one or are we going to use one which is nice without, uh, for instance, uh, using uh, nail... Po nail uh, uh, yeah, big nails or nail dirty nails. Dirty or, yeah. nails or whatever, just how to do it. Yeah. Hand yeah. models. Hand models, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, didn't know and always one. use the same hand model during the process instead of constantly changing the models. It's, it's happening with our students as well. It's I know the, the, the <laughs> very first iPhone, there's sort of the, this iconic picture of uh, the very first iPhone with a hand holding it. Yeah. And that hand model was, had a really big hand because at that time, oh. that phone was seen as a very big phone. So yeah. having a big hand makes it Even look small. Now that yeah. phone is tiny. It's really tiny, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's so yeah. funny how uh, uh, our hands stay the same. It, but It depends on time, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. It's a cultural phenomenon. Of yeah, now we have this brick, you know. Yeah, <laughs> or even foldable yeah. bricks. Foldable bricks. <laughs> so. And you, you like those, right? You like gadgets and, and so you... Yeah, I'm a gadget freak, but yeah. I don't buy them anymore. It's a guilty pleasure. It's a guilty pleasure, yeah. yeah. Because, um, uh, so that that's basically takes us to sort of that I fix it part. Also, uh, apart from it sort of being fun, and so there's this notion of sustainability there. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah definitely, so definitely, definitely. That's that's the whole key idea, I think. Yeah. That's why I joined them. 
Yeah, I, I was uh, so... Uh, Extending life of products, so why not? If you have the iMac, for instance, you can do it, you can work with an iMac for 10 years at least. It's, I got this iMac out of 2009, yeah. which actually still works very nicely. Yeah. And the software still runs, it never has bugs, it always works. I, I, I'm not going to change that for a new one. Why should I? Yeah. And it's really appealing as well. It's the aluminum version. Yeah. It's not the flat version, but it's still appealing. And it has a DVD play player in it, which is actually very important for my CD collection. Yeah. Because otherwise I cannot listen to my music anymore. <laughs> some people, some watchers uh, are going to like, what is a cassette player? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then the next is, what is a CD player? Yeah, yeah. I'm a CD freak. I don't. I don't uh, stream uh, music, I buy CDs, you know, those <laughs> things in shops in the city center. It's, yeah, no, that's uh, my now thing. it's sort of people know vinyl now. Yeah, I'm not searching for music, I browse music, and that's the difference. So, yeah. so if you do Spotify, you're searching, and it's constantly, but if you're browsing, you just have this complete list, uh, all these CDs, and you just look at it, ah, oh, this looks nice, or the cover looks nice, let's try this one out, and then just put it in a CD player. Then you only have music for 40 minutes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's sort of a constraint, right? I think Spotify is for elevators. For uh, sort of background music? Background music. For, not for, for consumption of music, but not for the sort of uh, reflection on music. Yeah, but on the other hand, that's if we talk about consumption, I consume materials because yeah. of the music, and that's bothering me sometimes. Yeah. Which is uh, frustrating, I think. It's constantly bothering me that I use materials instead of services. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, like you, I, I think, me too, I, we've grown up with a materialistic way of thinking. Yeah. And that's difficult to, to, to take this hurdle to not dematerialize. Yeah. And that's what I notice. I know that in Spotify, there's like this whole social part of making a very nice playlist that you can share with yeah. someone. Yeah, and that it's actually it becomes a gift. It becomes a thing of value. Yeah, like we had cassettes. Yeah, and, and mixtapes. Then and mixtapes. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So, uh, so actually, my, my uh, I bought for my daughter. Uh, you might sort of know that Jared Street. Yeah. They have the headphones. Yeah. And w uh, of course, they're always late, right? Because uh, so a Bluetooth headphone still waiting. For She's almost, uh, her birthday is almost there again and oh, still not there. Oh, a year later, yeah. But yeah. I, I ac we accept that. But then they gave us as a as sort of a thing, a, uh, they gave us a playlist sort of as waiting oh, yeah? therapy. Oh, wow. And it was really good. Yeah. So we were going, so we were, uh, the first initial was like a, 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 a Spotify playlist. Why? Why? <laughs> but then you list it and it's sort of, hey, it grows on you. So yeah. th there is nice, some, uh, nice, nice, so, nice. so there, that is a dematerialized uh, music yeah. experience that works. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still uh, walking around with my iPod, so I've got this iPod, yeah, 16 gig, yes, uh, which is excellent back then. <laughs> yeah, it has a, it has a. Yeah, a but my son has his playlist on it, so I can imagine. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and, and if you if you uh, take your iPods that were there from like years ago, it becomes a time capsule, right? Yeah, it is. It becomes yeah. an object that contains yeah. a, a moment in time. Yeah. Because that is, of course, the danger. You, so I have this playlist of, of Jared Street now, but at some point it just might poof, disappear. Oh yeah, you never know. I yeah. never know. Yeah, same thing with uh, books, I think. If you only have PDFs, it will disappear at a certain point. Yeah. And books will be there. Or yeah. you really have to actually throw them in the bin instead of uh, digitally throw them in the bin. Yeah. And that's something different. Digital is easier. That's, that's what I see also at the university now. So. So that, that, but so then sustainability is sort of that. That is uh, uh, the idea is that you attach to your product when you repair it yourself, right? Yeah. That's the I fix it mantra, yeah. and then you you use it longer because you have repaired it. Yeah, I think you're actually uh, motivated to use it longer after your repair. Yeah, and it gives you uh, and forces you. It gives you some good feeling about it as well. It's and to sort of think about, hey. Uh, this is good enough, right? Yeah, yeah. Because there might be, there's like always, the grass is always greener in of the course. newest phone. Nowadays we have four cameras in, in the front of, uh, of, of new smartphones. I don't know why, but I, some people think that's really a unique selling point. I think it's a unique crap point. And then, so, but then teaching sustainability. I noticed that mm. that's extremely hard. Uh, so I have this. So I finally got you to teach that 
uh, repair cafe. Yeah. But then I sometimes hear, yeah, that's not really sustainability because it's all about uh, there are more things. And sure, sure, there are more things. But there are. I, I noticed it's like, uh, so we've had this discussion with Rut as well, sort of designing for sustainability is like fighting for peace, right? It, <laughs> it is, it has its own paradox in it that you cannot create a product. Well, extending life is just yeah. extending crap. <laughs> yeah, <exten> <laughs> it? that's it, that's it. And I think uh, if we look at, uh, I've been in eco-design before, less, less is more. Yeah. So make, make the same thing with less materials, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but I, f I think circularity, circular economy, is, is all about b b the business cases. And uh, we had this masterclass on that uh, with 20 people from the field. Yeah. And they were a little bit flabbergasted because they said, well, this is not sustainable, circular economy. It's not per se sustainable. I said, no, it's not per se sustainable. If you want your materials back, for instance, at the end of a life. So it's all about recovery of materials or components or parts. Yeah. At the end of life, you have to take control. So you need to know where your materials are. Yeah. Uh, but actually that's, um, uh, you need to transport back all this stuff again, yeah. back to maybe a factory, recycle it, at a cost of a lot of energy. Yeah. So what's the sustainability about it? And I think the main sustainability is about you don't burn it. If you don't burn it, if it's burnt, it's not there anymore. And that's what's happening now. Everything is run through this incinerator and energy is made out of it. And they call it recycling, Yeah. thermal recycling. And yeah. I think it's a dirty word. Yeah, somebody said, uh, so I talked, uh, uh, so I have solar panels and I talked to a guy from Shell and he said, uh, oh, uh, but we do uh, solar energy. Yeah. It's just uh, prehistoric it's solar prehistoric, energy. It's prehistoric, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's laughing it away. Yeah, I know. They, they know they're uh, wrong. <laughs> yeah, but that's actually burning stuff, burning materials is well the, the end of everything. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, it's material cremation, as my uh, colleague uh, would say, yeah. Ingrid. And I think material cremation is, is is something we should not have. So extending life by u reusing materials, that's the last level. So that's yeah. what we call recycling and reusing parts, which actually have a value at a certain point, and then reusing products. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's what circular economy is all about. And it's not per se sustainable. No, I, I know... Uh, or impact, if you do I, an LCA, for instance. I know that uh, the, the, the woman from Apple, from sustainability, I don't know if you know her, but she used to be the sort of the, the green uh, person at uh, Obama's uh, policy. Oh, yeah? And uh, yeah, she's... Um, uh, she's, uh, she said, I want uh, Apple to be completely circular. Nothing gets out of the ground anymore and everything is from sort of... But then people that repair it themselves are sort of a cog in the yeah, wheel, we're, right? Yeah, we're the wrong people, yeah. They don't like that. Yeah. They don't have control over that. So they have the best intentions, right? Yeah, but they don't want people to repair their products. No. Uh, but they want they service could, repair, okay. But you said, uh, if, you, if you want to be circular, you have to take control of the whole system. That's, I think that's the general idea. About but then you have these rebels from iFixit come in, yeah. and they yeah. screw it up, right? Maybe. They put strange components in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, because actually at this moment nothing works, so it's not there yet. Yeah. And there's this conflict between DIY repair and service repair. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't team up with one of those. No. I think service repair is a good thing in circular economy. If Apple takes control of their products and uh, recycles, but also repairs stuff yeah. or harvest parts, because that's actually, they don't do that. No. They don't harvest parts and put them in refurbished products. They don't refurbish at all. No. They let other people refurbish, like Leap for instance, but they yeah. don't do it. They just take out the materials and recycle it. Yeah. And I think, well, come on guys, you can do better. Yeah. You can do a lot better to extend the material at a higher value. Yeah. And that's something which is actually not happening at this moment. No. So, and DIY repair, I think we're, uh, we're the f yeah. yeah, I like to do that. It's rebellious, isn't it? It's, re it's definitely <laughs> rebellious. So how, how would you, so I could imagine you getting that uh, washing machine that is uh, sort yeah. of circular where, where everything is controlled and then you are starting to repair things and that yeah. sort of breaks the system, yeah, right? Yeah, you can really crap it up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we, 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 we are sort of at the end of our conversation. Uh -huh. uh, what I always ask, and uh, I hope you have something, sort of a tip that we can share to our, uh, to our audience. Yeah. 
that helps them sort of uh, do something with this or other thoughts that they have? So yeah, do you have yeah, something? Yeah. I, I'm always uh, the guy about facts and figures. So facts and figures. I, facts and figures, back of the envelope calculation. I think all industrial designers, engineers should be uh, facts and figures based. So yeah. educated guesses, excellent, do that. Don't do gut feeling only, yeah. but also do educated guesses. And I like that doing these kind of small calculations on the back of the envelope, of course, which helps you out to finding the right direction. And I think Having those that information, uh, it's it's very important for to convey that also in a storytelling way. And how do you do that? So what what are tips? I, no, what one thing for instance, I do give a course, Demystify Green, where we try to uh, learn our students to uh, demystify uh, one of the uh, uh, a claim, an environmental claim in in public. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, windmills are very good for the environment. Okay, let's let's try to demystify this and come up with numbers. Yeah. So, how are we going to tackle that? So, they do have some research, but also they have to present it to somebody yeah. on a storytelling way. So, we have TEDx uh, experts coming in and oh. how to convey this information to layman people. And uh, uh, also have write an article for the Delta in this case. Okay. This is something completely different than writing an article for a journal paper. Yeah. And how to write articles and how to come up with arguments and how to substantiate these uh, arguments with numbers. Yeah. And how to present these numbers in a very uh, visual way which is appealing to everybody. And you, you have a book for yeah, that, I have right? A book. Uh, we've, we've done this one I read last summer. Storytelling with data. Yeah, it's uh, Cole Nussbaumer Knaflik. Uh, she's uh, she's, she's uh, one of the people. She worked at Google, uh, and ah. she learned. She taught people how to make dashboards online, for instance. It's very nice because uh, it contains many of these things that seem like direct exports out of Excel. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, it's very easy applicable. If I well. tell my students about storytelling with data, they come with uh, like uh, data is beautiful. Oh, infographics. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, but this is all about how to be. Going in a direction, going in, where, does, where do you want to end up with? Yeah. What's the story you want to tell? What's yeah. the main point? And that's where she starts with and how this data can help you out of it. Are you going to use tables, yes or no? Or are we going to use graphs? Pie charts are incredibly stupid. Yeah, they're the use. worst, right? They're the worst. Don't use them, especially not 3D pie charts. Yeah. Then. Because they give you complete different information. I always give this example if, you, if my uh, kids uh, want the maximum of something. If you do it in a glass, they can measure it easily by the horizon and sort of this. And if I give them a pie and I put them into, yeah, they don't. don't know which one is the best, right? <laughs> no. Because I can do it a little bit off center. Oh, that's an that. interesting one. Yeah, so, that's good. So if you want to confuse people, use a pie chart. Use a pie chart. Yeah. So that's good, right? And if you really want to confuse them, use a 3D pie chart. So, uh, so Tip sto of the day: <laughs> storytelling with data, confusing with data, confusing with data. That's and so, so my tip for uh, for the audience: I uh, I once uh, in an earlier podcast I talked about about 99% Invisible, which is sort of the, the ultimate podcast for talking about uh, invisible design. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have one uh, other uh, podcast that is quite closely related to it, and it's by Walter Isaacson. Yeah. And he, he, did a, uh, he does a podcast series, and it's, um, uh, it's sponsored by Dell Technologies. Okay. Uh, but it's uh, it's called Trails Bla Trail Blazers. Yeah. Walter Isaacson is best known for uh, the Steve Jobs uh, biography, which is not oh, yeah. a good biography, but it's everywhere, right? Yeah. You see his face yeah. on yeah. every salon table. He also made a great book about innovators in general, which is a lot about uh, f female, uh, fem the role of female people, female uh, well, wives or, you know. Or the wives off. Yeah, wives off. So, ah. so, you know, we have this 50 year uh, yeah, jubilee. Yeah, only guys. And of course, there. these are all white guys and it's <laughs> logical. I totally agree with it. But uh, sometimes it might help to sort of look at the partner behind yeah, yeah. Joost, uh, Joost yeah. van der Grinten. Or, uh, yeah. but, but he did that one. And he also talked about Leonardo da Vinci in a very nice biography. But yeah. in this, he takes topics, uh, communication or cooking, and you can just browse through them and click on one of them and you get a half hour, uh, nice. very well produced, oh, nice. uh, with uh, real, so if he talks about toys, he has the, the CEO of Mattel, so he has access, because Steve Jobs, right? 
And uh, he used to be the anchor, uh, the CEO of CNN as well. All right. Before it went nice. bad, maybe. So, so he has access. He has a real nice story. Very compact. Takes a topic, uh, takes, uh, tears it apart, and it's really interesting. I think one he goes very thorough in yeah. everything. One thing I learned is that he talked about smart home, and then he talked about Drebbel being the inventor of the smart home because oh, yeah? he was the first one who made the thermostat. Yeah. Yeah. And that's oh, the yeah. first self-regulating thing that existed. Yeah. That ex so before that, nobody could think of a system that would regulate itself. And this one did. And that's basically the thermostat in our house. But that's now also our U lamps. And all, they all regulate themselves. And that's called smart now. That's smart, yeah. yeah. So, smart. And I only knew Drebbelweg because that's where I had to put my models when I studied here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there was this, uh, that's for aerospace engineering. Yeah. If you would take the corner, there would be a huge wind blast from, from uh, el uh, electrical Elecon. engineering. Yeah. So I saw many dreams disappear with models that would fly oh, away yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> turn into crap. <laughs> 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 so that's, uh, yeah. th that's that place. Nice. nice. All right. So with that, we're at the end of, uh, unless there's something you still need to tell. So we have so, so much, much to tell. Oh, <laughs> let's do a second one. <laughs> um, uh, so, so thank you very yeah, much. Thank for you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and I want to uh, thank Mark de Kool for producing it. It's amazing that now these are appearing on the internet in such a good shape. And uh, Geraldo Solisa, who does the, he's from the New Media Center and does all the production of this. Yeah, excellent. And it really, for me, it's a blast to do this every time. So uh, me thank too. Thank you.